You ever see the commercial, and it took me a while to find out exactly which one it was, but years ago I remember seeing this commercial of uh, a guy with a hard hat on, and he put glue on his hard hat, and they, they stuck his head to the beam, and he's suspended by, by this hard hat. And uh, I think we got a picture to show you up there. And it took me a little while to find that. It's a crazy glue commercial. And uh, how many of you remember that? But when you see this, you just say, yeah, I remember seeing that. It's pretty pretty crazy. Now, you, you realize that the older you get, the more that you see on TV, the less you can believe, right? Uh, you know, you know that guy's not really up there. But the idea is really genius marketing behind it, because this is, in essence, what this marketing campaign is telling you and telling me, that if you buy our glue, this glue holds things together really well. I mean, not just okay or so-so, but extremely well, in fact, so well that you can bank your life on it. <laughs> now, I wouldn't bank my life on a tube of crazy glue, and I hope that you wouldn't either. But the point of that is, is that the commercial was trying to get across that our glue will absolutely hold things together. And when it comes to our text tonight, the Apostle Paul is addressing the believers at the church at, at the church of Philippi. This city, this church had been a great blessing to the Apostle Paul personally in his own life. And now this is the time in Paul's ministry in his life when he's being transported as a prisoner to Rome. And even particularly at this, this time in both of their lives and both of their ministries, the church at Philippi and the Apostle Paul, these individuals are still bound together uh, even though they're, they're being separated by a great distance. They're still bound very much together. In fact, notice verses 3 and 4 again. <coughs> Excuse me, the Apostle Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy. So even though they're apart by a great distance, they were still bound very tightly together together. And this church had a strong bond with the Apostle Paul, and he had a strong bond with them. And I want to remind us, especially as members of First Baptist Church tonight, that God desires that the local church sticks together. You understand that? That he expects members in his body to stick together. Uh, recently, my dad has had an amputation, and they've been fitting him with a prosthetic leg. And my mom... Uh, uh, when he got it in, in their home, she took a picture and she sent it to me. She told me she was going to, and I didn't quite expect the picture that I received. It was actually just a picture of his prosthetic legs standing up in the living room. Nothing else, just it standing there. And so I quickly texted her back and I said, he looks good, but where's the rest of him? <laughs> and I just tried to make a little fun of my dad and uh, the situation that was going on there. But the point is, is that you don't expect your body to just start falling apart. And if it does, then you've got some problems. And when it comes to the body of Christ, when it comes to the local church, God's desire isn't that it begins to fall apart. His desire is really that it sticks together. Think about this, that God's gifted the church with talents. Imagine all the talents that are represented here in this room. The abilities that are represented here. Opportunities that are within these four walls? What about desires? What about the members that God has blessed us with? Some brand new, some decades, maybe even longer that you've been a part of this church and all of those things are stuck together. Think about this, God's blessed our church with deacons. He's blessed our church with leaders. He's even blessed this church throughout all of its years of history with pastors, men who have led this church in the direction of following God. And tonight in our text, I'd like to lift out three specific truths, three simple truths here that I pray are really going to be a help to you and me tonight. So I'm going to show you tonight three elements that God uses to bind a church together. Three elements God uses to bind a church together because if He desires that a church, and let's just be specific, if He desires that our church, this church, stick together, how are we going to do that? What has He equipped us with and given us so that we can stick together? Well, here's the first thing. It's the fellowship of the gospel. Look at verse number 5, if you would, please. The Bible says, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. I like that word fellowship. That word fellowship implies the idea of community or joint participation. And I like that. I like that when it comes to a church, that this is a community. A lot of the seeker-sensitive churches today want to use that church. This is our community of faith and those type of things. And that is a biblical idea, but... 
for, they don't really mean it the way that I like it. I like the idea of what the Bible calls it as a church, a called out assembly, a separating from what's comfortable to you and coming together voluntarily under a common cause, which is the truth of God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when it comes to this idea of fellowship, I like that idea of joint participation. Everybody pulling together. Everybody striving together in the same direction. And now think about this. Here's the Apostle Paul. He started this church, but now he's going to Rome as a prisoner. He's been basically removed from his avenue of direct influence with his church. No longer is he able to go and fellowship in person and show up and admonish them and encourage them, which is why we have this particular letter that's being sent to the church. He's still able to encourage them, but not like it was before, not as intimately as they had in times past. But even though, I want you to think of this, even though that he wasn't able to minister to them directly as he once did, he reminds them that they could still have confidence that God was going to provide their spiritual growth and their fulfillment. Look at verse number 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, help me out, who is he, church? Paul? No. Who is it? God. Being confident that he which hath begun a good work in you, what does he say? Will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So this idea that Paul reassures them with is, I might be out of the picture, but I want to encourage you, God is going to fulfill and complete what he started. And I don't know about you, but that's really exciting to me, that when God begins a work, he wants to keep working on that till it's finished. If God begins a church, he wants to keep working in that body of believers until his work in them and through them is finished. And so Paul is reminding them, saying, I know it seems dark. I know it seems difficult. I'm a prisoner going off to Rome, but don't put all your eggs in my basket because I want you to understand that just like God used me, God can use somebody else to finish and to perform the work that he began. See, God wasn't going to leave them high and dry. And sometimes we think that about God, don't we? We think that he just stops and, oh no, what's going on? I've used this illustration before, but it's a lot like the dentist. How many of you like the dentist? I was, I was going to see who's crazy in here. <laughs> I've never enjoyed going to the dentist. That's always made me apprehensive. I remember having panic attacks as a kid. I didn't know what to call them then, but I'm sure that's what they were. That's what they felt like to me, either that or heart attacks. I can't tell. But I remember I'd just grab the seat and chair, and I would shake. My heart would pound so hard it shook the chair. And, and the, you know, the little nurse would come in, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. And I was just praying that it would get over with quickly. But I remember, and, and if you've been to the dentist, the same thing, the dentist walks in and he does a little bit of things here and there, and then he leaves. Now, where's he go? I don't know. Comes back in and puts the little Q-tip in there to get you all numbed up, and then he leaves. Leaves a Q-tip in there. And your mouth starts feeling funny. You start swallowing stuff, and now you can't feel half your tongue. And after all, you realize later on, it's a good thing. No feeling is a good thing at the dentist. <laughs> Uh, so he comes back in, he pulls that out, and he goes, dude, this might pinch a little bit. Oh, ha, 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 ha. He sticks it in the, oh, you know, and he, and he ejects you and sticks that big five-inch needle around anywhere that he wants to stick, and then he leaves. And he comes back in in a few minutes, and then they start, you know, then they, they start the, you know, and that sound. I mean, what I love is when he leaves and you hear that sound, people going, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> go, I'm done. I think I'll come back later. But here's the idea that, that you, you might think that he's not doing anything. I mean, oh, well, why don't you just keep working, Doc? Where are you going? Well, when he leaves, he probably goes out to laugh at you and how your face is numb and you can't talk right. And I love how they ask you questions once you have both their hands in your mouth, you know? How are you today? Oh, <laughs> you know? I just want to give them a dirty look, but I, you can't really do that either. No, they don't just leave and make fun of you. What do they do? Even though they leave the room, they're still working. It might not be on you, and it might not be as active as you think, but even though they leave, they're still at work. And I want to remind you and remind me tonight that even though we might not see God working, He is always at work. He's always at work. Maybe you can't purposefully identify it and Mark out that, yeah, God's working here and God's working there, and especially within our church, God's working on them and God's working on them and God's working on them and God's working on me. Even though you may not be able to directly to see it, God is at work. And Paul reminds this church that if he started a work, 
Don't worry about it. He'll finish it. Because that's what he wants to do. Notice in verses 7 and 8 that Paul's faith wasn't shaken by this situation. And in fact, he doesn't even give us the idea that he's disheartened at all. Think about this. Here's a man who's invested a lot in this church, and now he's not able to keep working directly in this church. Look at verse 7. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. See, the idea here is that Paul loved this church and its people, and he loved ministering to them and watching them grow. However, he didn't lose confidence in the fact that what God had begun with him, he would continue that with somebody else. And that's encouraging to our church as well. What God has begun in this church through other pastors, he will continue that through somebody else. That's what he's going to do. Paul had confidence in that respect, and we should as well tonight. I want you to notice, though, three specific desires that Paul had toward these believers. Look at verse number 9. He says, In this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in, in knowledge and in all judgment. The first desire is, is that he had is that their love would abound more and more. And I think that's a great desire to have, that a local church should always be increasing their love to one another and to the world who doesn't really know the Lord. And I think that's a good desire for our church to have, that we concentrate on that. Do you understand that love is something you got to work at? <laughs> People use that expression, I fell in love, like it's this vat of tar that you just can't get out of. You're just walking along and you oh, and you just can't get out of it. But then people like to say this, well, I just don't love them anymore. I've fallen out of love with them. And love's not necessarily in the Bible, it's not really that idea of a feeling as much as it is a choice. Choosing to love people. Love's really a commitment. It's deciding I'm going to do this whether I really feel like it or not. I told somebody on the Sony bus on Saturday, you know, it's you can like somebody that you don't love, and you can love somebody that you don't like. <laughs> you really can. Love's a choice. And I think it's great that the Apostle Paul, one of the biggest desires that he had for this church is that they kept abounding in the love that they had for one another and for the world. And I want to encourage us as First Baptist Church, even though we don't specifically have a pastor right now, I think it'd be a great testimony for us that we keep abounding in love toward one another and for the world outside. I think it's just that those should be, just be the norm. And Paul's trying to tell these believers that, hey, hey, even though I'm out of the picture right now, I want to encourage you to keep abounding in love more and more. He says, more and more and more and more. And just when you think you've hit that level, go a little bit further in this area of love. Look at the second desire. That they would approve things that are excellent. Look at verse number 10. That you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. You see, the idea, and really the norm for human beings, myself included in this, is that we sort of tend to go with just what's, what's average or mediocre. You know, we learn, uh, I remember the, one, one, of the, one of the first cars that I got was a, an Oldsmobile. I think it was an 88 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme Classic. Had the T-tops that you could pop off and move. It was, whoo. I was styling. I drove that to college. It was a babe magnet. Unfortunately, I was not a babe magnet, so they sort of canceled each other out there. But anyway, <laughs> I love that car. Now, you, you know, you couldn't fill it up with gas while it was running. You'd never catch up with it. V8 engine. Love that car. But I remember that when I got it. It was my dad's baby. My, my other Oldsmobile that my mom had given me all those years earlier, it threw a rod through the engine. It gave up the ghost. It was gone. <laughs> A couple of days before I had to go back to college. Now my dad said, unfortunately, I've got to let you take this. And reluctantly, he signed over the title to me. And I remember when I would come home and visit, I would, I would vacuum, you know, vacuum the back glass out, get all the dead bees and bugs that are up there. I'd, I'd, I'd wipe the inside. I mean, I polished the thing. I, I'd go and shine up the rims and the, and, the, and the tire. I mean, I wanted it to look sharp. And I remember this one day. I remember it just like it was yesterday that my dad was in the garage. And I'm, I mean, I'm inside the thing sweating because I want it to look so good. And he calls out to me. He said, you won't do that for long. Oh, yeah, I will. You know, I'm in there arguing with my dad. I sure will. No, no, there's going to be a day you're not going to care about some of that. Oh, yeah, I promise. Can I tell you he's right? 
Pretty soon, I didn't care so much that there was a dead bee all the way in the back that I wouldn't ever see, and some dust that got on the dash, and you know, eventually there were so many streaks in the windshield, as long as I could just move the part where I looked through, it didn't really bother me that bad. The point of that is, is that even though we might start out very, very detailed on some things, that as life goes on, we sort of just do what's enough to get by. You know, I don't have to do it as excellent, I don't have to do it as first class as really that I need to. I think I can get by if I do it this way. You know what Paul's admonition to church, this church was? We need to do things with an excellent spirit. We need to do things to the best of our ability. Why? Because we don't do them for one another. We really do them for the Lord. And whether Paul was around or not, God deserved their best. Hey, as First Baptist Church, whether there's a pastor or not, God deserves our best, doesn't He? We need, we need to approve things that are excellent. Look at the third desire, though, that they would be filled with the fruits of righteousness. In verse number 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. You see, the fact is that he longed that their faith would flourish and be full of the fruit that God intended for them because of their obedience. So we see the first element is the fellowship in the gospel. Look at the second one, the furtherance of the gospel. Look at verse number 12, if you would, please. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. See, a lot of times life is going to throw us some unexpected situation. It reminds me of the disciples. They were throwing an unexpected situation on the Sea of Galilee. They're out there rowing around, and a storm comes up. And the storm is raging, and Jesus Christ is asleep in the boat, and they're, they're terrified. And through the process of time, they wake Jesus up, and Jesus stands, and as we, uh, many of us can recount the story, He, he calms the storm and the, the sea. He, he makes it stop. And He turns around, and basically to sum up what He says, He ultimately says, why are you afraid? Don't you have any faith? I mean, you guys are the, the, the cream of the crop here. You guys have been around God in the flesh. And He says, what's... What's wrong with you? Why are you afraid of this? Where's your faith? Don't you have any faith, any real faith? Because the truth is, sometimes we fail, don't we? Sometimes we lose faith in unexpected times. We, we oftentimes think, I'm going to have faith if a hard time comes, but it's the ones where we have our guard down that's a little hard for us to immediately respond with faith. Well, sometimes it's really the opposite of faith. It's fear. We become very, very feel, fearful. And so Paul's in prison here, and he's, he's dealing with the difficulty. And now because he's a prisoner that's being carried off to Rome, he's actually put a church, a young church, in difficulty as well. But here's the part that I love about this. Because we would want to ask, looking at this account and this passage, why, why would this happen? Paul's a faithful preacher of the gospel. He's trying to do what's right. Why is he a prisoner now? Why is he going far away where he can't influence people? Why does the church have to go through this with their mentor, with their, their, their starter, their, their, uh, uh, the, the man who helped birth that church into being? Now they're without him and his direct influence. Why would they go through that? Hey, let's pull it into our life and ministry of our church. Why are we going through what we're going through right now? Why would we have to do that? I love what Paul says because he gives us the answer in verse number 12. He says it's unto the furtherance of the gospel. Paul answers this question of why by saying it's really for the furtherance of the gospel. You see, Paul, as well as these believers, they really chose to respond in the right way during this time of, of unexpected difficulty. And because of this, we see some very beneficial results. You're going to see the first one in verse number 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. The first one is that it stirred others to action. That this furtherance of the gospel, this unexpected difficulty, it actually stirred more people to get involved. Paul said that when I went off into my bonds, some people got stirred up and they actually got involved. That would be a great prayer to pray for the life of our church at this, at this particular juncture of our ministry. It's not that people slack up, but even that some people who haven't been involved actually get involved. People that have cooled off get hot again. They get involved. It stirred others to action. Let's notice those expressions that he says, waxing confident in my bonds, that in the bonds that he had of being a prisoner, some began to wax confident because they saw the price that Paul was willing to pay. 
Hey, it's Super Bowl Sunday. It's easy to be uh, an expert when you're watching things. It's very much different when you're involved. Uh, listen, I love being involved in a local church. If you've never been involved, you're missing out. You're missing out on some things. In fact, it, it helps you be more concerned about things. I really believe that a lot more Christians would get very sober and more concerned about things if they were more involved in them. Because it's easy to make decisions of things that don't really affect you, isn't it? Uh, let's do that. Let's take that off. Let's shorten that. Let's, let's fire those people. I mean, if you've got CEOs that don't really care except about a bottom line, it seriously affects it. But if you work alongside somebody or it's your personal responsibility, things are a lot different. If you don't believe me, how many of you that have children, it's easy to talk about other people's kids, but what about your own kids that are dealing with some of the same struggles? It puts a different context on it, doesn't it? It puts it in a different light. And so when it comes to the local church, the Apostle Paul said, hey, I'm glad that I've gone away, if nothing else, because the gospel is being furthered, because more people are getting stirred to be involved. The second thing is that it spread interest in, the, in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 15. The Bible says, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So here's the situation that's going on. Some are preaching Christ out of pretense, and some out of genuine love. And guess what Paul said? I'm glad it's going on, both of them. Because it's generating an interest in Jesus Christ. Why do difficult things come our way? Under the furtherance of the gospel. Look at the third thing that it does is that it solidified Paul's commitment. Look at verse number 20. He says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing shall I, shall, that I, I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, and I like that expression, as always, just like it was when I had my freedom. He said, I want it to be the same way, as always. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what, sh what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, there's that confidence again. I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. You see this? whole difficult situation has sort of helped Paul get concreted down even more what God had given him for his life purpose and for his ministry. And I want to encourage you that really a time of testing, a time of difficulty, it, it does have a purging effect. It's really to help consolidate what God has begun in our life. It's to help really bore that down, help us to nail that down. If you're in a class and you're going through a rough time, God intends for that to really set in concrete what He's put in your heart and your life to do as a ministry to Him. See, we often ask, why is this happening? <laughs> but the answer Paul gives us is under the furtherance of the gospel. We need to remember that. Next time we go through a difficult situation, I know it's hard. It's going to be by faith. We've got to do it by faith. But I think it would be good if we step back and we ask, how is the gospel going to be furthered because of this? How can it be? What can God use and do in this difficult situation to further the gospel? And here's the third thing, the third element. The fellowship in the gospel, the furtherance of the gospel, and I like that God alliterates the third one in verse 27, the faith of the gospel. Notice the last one here. Only let your conversation, he says in verse 27, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. See, God's Word declares that without faith it's impossible to please God, and we understand that. But uh, this is not specifically the faith which is mentioned here. We're not talking specifically about the faith in God, the measure of faith that we put in the Lord personally for salvation, but there is a faith that was once delivered to the saints. And by faith, what we mean is the truth of God, God's truth. The faith, the faith, is passed on to man. 
And just like in any case, when we hear the truth and we respond to that truth according to God's Word, we place our measure of faith in the truth of God, in the person of Jesus Christ. And because of that, our life of faith is born, it's born, it's birthed into existence. That's why the Bible says, from faith to faith. But we use the truth of God. And here, the Apostle Paul is using that word, the faith, as the idea of the truth of God. This body of truth that has been delivered to us as believers. And because of this body of faith, this truth of God, it's vitally important that nothing should be allowed to hinder its working and fulfillment in our lives. In fact, Paul reminds them, these believers specifically, how they should behave themselves. He uses that word conversation. Notice it again. Only let your conversation be as it become of the gospel of Christ. And this isn't just our words, but it's literally talking about our lifestyle, our behavior. Let the way that you live exemplify the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what are some regulators that we have to make sure that we do that? If that's the desire God has, is that, if that's the desire that the Apostle Paul had for this young body of believers, then how are we going to regulate not damaging or hindering the truth of God and its working in our life? Paul tells them to us really simply, very familiar passage of Scripture. He says here the first one, to stand fast in one spirit. Standing fast, this gives this idea of defending or guarding against. And this idea of the spirit really, really comes into play with attitude. You know, when the Bible talks a lot about Saul had an evil spirit, sometimes we think he was demon-possessed when the Bible talks that way. But the spirit oftentimes will, uh, will give illustration to our attitude. And we would say that sometimes. I'm just bothered in my spirit. There's something that's just not exactly right. And when the Apostle Paul has, tells here about our conversations should be becoming to the gospel of Christ, he said one of the regulators of that is standing fast in one spirit, meaning this, that Paul admonished these believers not to have a divided attitude toward the truth. That if we're going to stay together, we're going to stick together as a church, we cannot be divided on our attitude when it comes to the truth of God. We can't have some faction that believes this is the Word of God and some that don't. We can't have two people that give their own opinion about the Bible and they both think that they're right when it comes to the truth of God and both those viewpoints are contrary one to another. We, it has to come down to the fact that we have to be unified, striving together, standing fast in one spirit, the Bible says. Notice the second thing, though. He says, stand fast in one spirit with one mind. One mind. This mind, the word mind here is referring not so much to, it's referring to what we think. Uh, it's not referring to what we think, but it's really referring to a mindset. It's how we think. So it's not saying that we're supposed to have one mind of what's on our mind, but it's basically saying how we think with our mind should be the same. Uh, would that not be in agreement uh, with the Bible that God's desire is that our mind be like Jesus Christ? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Does that mean God wants to give you new brains? How many of you like to have a new brain sometime? Man, I wish I had more brains. I wish I used the ones I had better. Uh, but that's the idea behind this that the Apostle Paul is saying. Not that God gives you different brains, but really He teaches you to use your brain differently. <laughs> Uh, he's telling you to take your brain and actually use it in a way that you haven't been using it before. Not new brains, but a new way of using your brain. Paul admonishes them to have the same collective mindset when it comes to Jesus Christ. See, there should be a solitary purpose and direction in a church. People, when they visit a church, when they walk in a church as a member of the church, it shouldn't seem like that there's 18 heads pulling in different directions. What it means is, it, is a church needs a solitary direction, a solitary purpose that everybody is on board with. And can I make it simple what it's supposed to be? It's supposed to be God's purpose and God's direction. That's what a church needs. Hey, if we're going to stick together the way God intends, we need to stand fast in one spirit, with one mind. And notice the last thing. He says, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Notice he didn't say striving with or against one another. Sometimes in churches, it's very tempting for our flesh to get in the way, isn't it? I'm right, you're wrong. I, I've heard people argue about the dumbest things. 
And, and really, I wanted to ask them, is being right worth the cost that you're going to make right here? Is losing your testimony worth being right? I've been to restaurants before and people throwing a fit because their baked potato was cold. And I wanted to say, is it really that important to lose your testimony over something <laughs> that grows that you're going to eat? Is it really that important? And there's some people, some Christians, some, some people who just think, I want to be right so bad, I don't care what it costs. And in fact, what they're doing is they're sacrificing an awful lot on the altar of pride, on the altar of ego. They'll burn everything up just to say, I was right and you were wrong. But you know what the Apostle Paul is saying here? He said, we don't need to be striving against one another, striving with one another. That's not what a church is all about. Why did God save us so we could fight together all the way to heaven? <laughs> of course not. This idea of striving together. All of you pulling in the same direction, like a tug of war, like a team of rowers. Everybody pulling at the same time, pulling in the same direction. That synergy that we need in propagating the gospel and doing the work of God. Hey, nobody can do this all by themselves. Our church can't even do it all by itself. We need support. We need help. We need everybody involved pulling in the same direction. We don't have time for everybody getting over in the little corner and I'm right and you're wrong and I think this should be done this way and this should be done that way. No, no, we, don't, we, need, we have to be going in the same direction, solitary purpose, solitary direction. We're following after God and what He wants for us. And as we do that, we all need to be striving together. Why? He tells us, for the faith of the gospel. The faith. The body of truth. Hey, there's more important things than what I think. There's the truth of God. I mean, let's just be honest. I don't always have to have my way. Neither do you. There should be some things that by default are way more important than you and I. And one of the biggest ones is the truth of God, the faith of the gospel. See, Paul's desire for this church is that they should be unified in the struggle. The striving together is the idea of a wrestler. This intense struggle. And Paul's telling you, that's how we need to labor for the Lord. We need to be striving together. This intensity, this passion. Sad to say, I, I, there's, there's times when I don't have it in my life as I should. I remember as a teenager when I would hear men get up and they'd preach and they'd yell and they'd sweat and they'd, they'd get all emotional about things and part of me just wanted to be like, what is the big deal? Who cares really? But I want to tell you, and thankfully so, there was a day when God got a hold of me and I'm glad that He put a purpose in my heart and in my life to preach the gospel and to follow Him and to take His book and not just read it, not just study it, but apply it to my own life. And as I do that, I have opportunity to, to share some of the things that God has showed me from His Word with other people. And I want to tell you that as that process goes on, God will give you a desire to do what He wants you to do. And the same way with your life, if you don't have this intensity and this passion, Paul is saying, you are missing out on a very vital element in your Christian life and also in the support of your church. Are you striving together or are you just saying, eh, 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 oh, hum, somebody else can pull my weight? We got a lot of good pretenders in God's church today. Oh, they're there, but a man could, could be there too. A rock could be there too. Are you striving together? Hey, do you know when you strive together as a church? You're going to feel some of the tension when somebody else feels some of the tension. But if you both pull in the same direction, you're also easing it for one another. We had a church picnic not that long ago. They did tug of war. And I felt old after that. Man, my hands got, you know, that, that rope. And you think, well, Brother Doug, you're a big guy. You should have added some stability to that. <laughs> yeah, but it, my problem is, I, I, you know, I just I can't get this moving when I want to move. When I move, want to move and Add to that. But hey, you can tell when somebody's not pulling. If you're on the rope, if you've got a hold of it and you're giving it everything you got, you can tell when somebody's not pulling. And you say, hey man, <laughs> put some weight into it. They used to say that. Put your back into it. What are you saving it for? I want to admonish us as Christians. What are we saving? All our time, all our energy, all our effort, all our resources, what are we saving that for? Because the Bible says one of these days, everything is going to burn up. And all that we've ever done as a child of God is going to be cast 
into God's purifying flame. And there's going to be some people who thought they've done a lot, but it's going to burn up as wood, hay, and stubble. Gone. He said, but there's going to be some people that you didn't think was very much at all. And they're going to throw it in there. And out are going to come these precious stones. Gold. Silver. Why? I believe. Because they didn't hold anything back. They gave God their best. They gave God their all. They did what they could to strive together. Why? For the faith of the Gospel. Hey, in closing, we're all going to give our life to somebody or something. Why would we not give it to something that's going to be worthwhile? Give it to God. I don't see a lot of result in that right now. You may not right now. You may live your whole life and never see it. But why are you going to do it? Because you get a result? Or because you know that's what's best? Because that's the purpose God has given you and given me. So let me ask you tonight. What's holding First Baptist Church together? Well, it should be these elements that we talked about. The fellowship and the gospel. How's your confidence in God tonight? Are you confident that what He started, He will finish? Because He will. Oh, it might not be the way that you think, but He will. The furtherance of the gospel. How do you react when the unexpected comes? Do you have faith enough to see where God's going to further the gospel in that unexpected situation? And what about the faith of the gospel? In what ways are you trying to work and maintain the truth of God that He's given to you? And are you striving together in one spirit, with one mind, for the faith of the gospel?